guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, lesson 33, Mark 5. Yes, continuing to talk through and sound out what I would consider some of the, the, the most amazing scripture verses that you're going to find. I mean, think about this. We're talking about the life of Jesus Christ. We're talking about how he is serving the people around the Sea of Galilee area. And like, to me, like, what an incredible way to live how we can learn from him, what are our takeaways. In Matthew, he serves as a king. And now here in Mark, he's just primarily focused as the servant. Now at the end of Mark 4, remember this, right? The, the waves are crashing on the boats, they're swamping the boats, and Jesus wakes up from the stern and he rebukes the wind and he speaks to the sea and everything calms down. And he basically calls out his disciples. He's like, hey, I thought you guys were with me. <laughs> I thought you believe in me. I mean, that's what he's saying. How, how dare you have this unbelief? And then it says they're even terrified and freaking out even more because this Jesus that they've known is like, he's, he's speaking and in control of, the, of, of nature. Now they're going to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Why? Kevin, you remember why they're going on the other side? Probably. Get away from people. Get away from people. Remember the other boats? They're still following them around. The storms calmed down. Everybody got blessed because Jesus calming the storm. And as they come across, now watch in Mark 5, they're coming. It says, as they came to the other side of the sea, I'm in verse 1, to the region of the Gerasenes, as soon as he got out of the boat. Remember, Jesus is coming to rest. <laughs> A man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. So you're like, um, uh, this is not what I was planning on, right? But Jesus is always ready because he got some rest on the boat. That wasn't the rest he was looking for, but probably he got what he needed. And my point is, is that as soon as you have rest, get ready to do more ministry. And so the disciples, hopefully they're prepared. And so what you're going to see in 1 through 20 is that Jesus begins to cast out demons from a human. And then, Kevin, do you remember where they go? In the pigs. Into the pigs. And then the large, hu uh, large herd of pigs in verse 11 says, As they were cast out, these demons were cast out, go into the pigs, they're feeding on the hillside. And then it says, With permission, he gave the unclean spirits to go in into the pigs, 2,000 of them. Can you imagine just watching that? Can you imagine if there's like a little shepherd on the side? He's like, Whoa. <laughs> like, what's all that? <laughs> like, hey, what's all the waves for? You know, fishermen's out in the boat. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> 2,000 pigs rushed into the steep bank. This is the backdrop of Jesus coming to the other side, full on ministry as soon as he hits the ground running. I just, I love this image of Jesus. Yes, he rests, but he also doesn't stop. People need to continually be set free. And I love this is that you're going to see coming up. And this is where we're going to talk today. And I, I love the pig story. I love the demons and how they're, you know, being cast out. But I want to talk a little bit more about how Jesus interacts with the people. And we're going to talk about two individuals. You're going to see a double miracle. Okay, I think it's a cool picture in, in the Gospel of Mark. You can see a double miracle of two drastic types of people. One is Jairus. Jairus. I think that's how we'll... Jairus? Jairus. Let's just say Jairus right now. Jairus is one of them. And Jairus is an important synagogue officer. He's probably well-to-do. And then you have a woman who, at the point that we're interacting with, she's bankrupt, which means she probably has no money. So here you have a synagogue official, Jairus, and then you have Jairus, and then you have a woman uh, who, de who desperately needs help. This is where we're going to see a double miracle. And I, I just want to tell you now, Jesus does not show favoritism. I'm just going to go there right now. When you're serving people, as we look at the Gospel of Mark, Okay, he doesn't show favoritism. And I think that's really important in ministry because sometimes when you're ministering to, let's just say Elkhart County, you know, you could minister to what we would call the, the English. Okay, you have Amish and you have English. You could say, oh, I'm only going to interact with the English, but Jesus would interact with the Amish as well. And you can't just say, I'm going to interact only with the Amish and say, well, I'll never interact with the English. No, the gospel is meant for all. And that's what I love about this story is that every person I believe scripture says, and Solomon even says this in Ecclesiastes, every person, their heart is longing for more. And I'll just say the end goal is they're longing for life. And Jesus wants to give out this life. He wants to set people free. And part of the problem of the church, and like you're like, gosh, why you, don't be hard on the church. I'm just saying this, is that we expect the life message to be given out from the, the buildings. The way Jesus served, what you're going to see in Mark 5 and why I decided to focus on this part rather than the demons and the pigs, is that Jesus is engaging the culture. He's engaging the crowd right where they're at. He doesn't wait for them to come in and, oh, I have a seat on pew number three. 
No, he interacts with people and he doesn't show favoritism. And in Mark 5, verse 21, it says this, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side. <laughs> Have you noticed how Jesus gets in the boat a lot? And oh, let's just leave this side now. We've, there's some people maybe mad about the whole pig thing. And let's go to the other side. Let's go to the northwest side of Galilee. And they ended up in Capernaum. Let's go back to Capernaum. A large crowd gathered around him while he was by the sea. Poor guy. Everywhere Jesus goes to serve. And I think he's okay with this, but it's like constantly the large crowd is following him. And in fact, in Matthew 9, 1, Kevin, if you can go there, just to show you this, there's three gospel accounts of this story. Okay? Three gospel accounts, Matthew 9, 1, but there's three gospel accounts. Just want you to understand that the gospel account in Mark is by far the fullest account of this story. But I just want to say, this is where he was going. It says, so he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. So that's how we know he went back to his headquarters. He went back to Capernaum. Okay, just so you know where we get these things, you got to tie these different stories together. And so it says, he came back to his town, verse 22. One of the synagogue uh, leaders, I'm in Mark 5, verse 22. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Before we go on to 23, anybody else think this is really weird? How do you get to this point? How do you get to be one of the religious guys that technically was probably opposed to Jesus at some point? Remember the opposition from the family, opposition of the religious, of the enemies? Jairus fits into that camp, and when he sees Jesus come back into Capernaum, it says he fell at his feet. So obviously, something personal is happening in his life. There's another reason why you would fall at Jesus' feet. And I don't think just even reading this, like this is not a disciples at the boat saying, Jesus, you don't care about us. I think this is a genuine falling at his feet because there's something stirring. And we know this because look what it says in verse 23. It says he kept begging him. It wasn't just a one-time plea. He desperately loved his daughter. So much so that he went to Jesus. He said, my little daughter is at death's door. Come Lay your hands on her and look what he says. So she can get well and live. He wanted life, right? To make sure it's going to continue to happen for his daughter. He knows that there's death and life and who gives life? Jesus. He knows that his recognition of coming to his feet is that he knows it, that he gives life. And, you know, Kent Hughes says this, desperation is a prelude to grace. I love this image. Desperation will allow us to realize we need something more than ourselves. And Jairus' daughter is, is literally dying. And, and Jairus, he fell at his feet and he begged, his, he begged him constantly, spare my daughter. I need her to live. <laughs> so in verse 24, Jesus, look at this. This is crazy. He went with Jairus, the religious synagogue official, he went with him. So the, the, the two, you know, maybe with time, you know, there was an enemy in Jesus, you know, and Jesus is walking with them in a large, large crowd. There's, there's the pattern again. Everywhere Jesus goes, there's a large crowd. There's some boats. There's some more boats. There's a large crowd and everywhere he goes. And they're pressing against Jesus. So Jesus's goal, okay, just so we're all on the same page. He's going to go. He's been asked to go bring healing to Jairus' daughter. That's, that's the mission. That's where he is going. And, and here's what I want to just say about Jesus as a servant. You know what he's doing? He's walking with him. He doesn't just say, oh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll pray right here. As a servant, he goes amidst the crowd and walks and engages with him. When, you, when, you, when somebody's going through sickness, when somebody's going through grieving the loss of a loved one, you know what the best thing you can do? Go be with them. Go spend time with him. Even if you don't have words, literally just be present. Amidst Jesus walking with Jairus, the synagogue official, it says everybody is pressing in on him. And then it says in verse 25, a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years. Said in verse 20, 12, 12 years. A woman suffering for 12 years. Okay, a couple, a couple things. One is that she's automatically in that context, ceremonially unclean. Okay, if you have ongoing ble uh, bleeding, you know, it's a persistent blood flow. Somebody said it's a severe menstrual period that's just never stopping. Every time she walks, she has to think to herself, I'm unclean. And then you know what that means, Kevin, if they're unclean, what does that mean? 
And not even supposed to be around other people. Yeah, and so if you go back to verse 24, it says the crowd is pressing in. There's a really good chance the unclean woman <laughs> is touching everybody. And I don't mean like blood is getting everywhere. So I just I want to give you a, a visual here. It just means that her body, her unclean body is touching everybody, which back then meant she was unclean. And, you know, I was even talking about one of my trips uh, recently to uh, the Middle East. And as I was interacting with somebody in the Middle East, uh, I shook this, this female's hand. And as I shook her hand, you could tell she was kind of like, I, you can't shake. It was, she was trying to be polite, shake my hand, but she knew she wasn't supposed to. And it was because she wasn't married and it would automatically make her unclean if I shook her hand. Taylor. So was there a punishment for her being in public? Like would she have been stoned and she's actually like risking her life? To this lady suffering? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes they would have put her out on a camp. You know, uh, maybe stoning at some point, uh, but for sure putting out as a camp. And in fact, here's what they would have done. Uh, Leviticus 15, uh, 25 through 27. I don't know if you have my notes, but that was, thank you for that transition. I really appreciate it. Leviticus 15, 25 through 27. When a woman has a discharge of her blood. Ah, we haven't been to this topic in a long time. When a woman has a discharge of her blood for many days, though it is not the time of her menstruation, or if she has a discharge beyond her period, she will be unclean all the days of her unclean discharge, as she is during the days of her menstruation. Keep going to verse 26. Any bed that she lies on during the days of her discharge will be like her bed during menstrual impurity. Any furniture she sits on will be unclean as in her menstrual period. And then verse 27. Everyone who touches them, which would mean if you touch her as well, will be unclean. He must wash his clothes, bathe with water, and he will remain unclean until evening. Yeah, there's going to be a whole lot of washing going on. Like That's what should have happened. She should have walked around with a sign on her head that just said unclean. Everybody around us. Everybody around me has, has touched me. Now watch this in verse 26. She's gone through this process for a really long time. She's endured much under many doctors. How long? 12 years. Now, okay, all of a sudden Jesus is with Jairus pursuing the healing of his daughter, right? Walking with him. And then all of a sudden you have really um, uh, a woman bleeding for 12 years. This is her story now. So it's kind of like, at first she wanted to say, well, there's, here's a major pause button, right? But they're describing somebody in the crowd that's pressing in. She said they've, that she's endured much uh, under many doctors. She spent everything she had, which means she doesn't have anything left. So she has tried to get shots that work. She's tried to get steroids at work. She's tried to get, you know, a patch. Um, my point is, is, anything that would help bring about healing Nothing has happened. And I just want to say this, though. You don't use this verse as anti-medical, anti-hospital. I've actually heard this argument of people of saying, oh, we shouldn't do it. No, in this situation, God wanted to heal her differently. And so she's going to go for what she's hearing. Jesus, this Jesus, watch, it says in verse 7, having heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd. I, I, I do think it's funny that she came behind him, you know, like, boo, you know, like maybe that'll come back on me. She came behind him and she touched his robe. What would she may, maybe have touched, do you think? Anybody have any thoughts? What are those tassel things from the Old Testament? Yeah, one of the four tassels. God, it's like, it's like he's in tune, man. He's on it. It's my fourth cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in Numbers 15, 37 through 40, you don't need to go there. But yeah, these guys would have been wearing tassels. So if I could just touch... His tassel. And when you go into the Middle East and you see even a Jewish person, you'll see Orthodox Jews today still wearing and you'll see these tassels. And so she said, if I can just touch his robes, I'll be made well. Like her, her faith actually motivated her to act. Belief doesn't mean just sit. Faith means let's get out and walk this thing out. And I, I like this. Augustine, he combined everything together with what happened with this woman that was bleeding. Okay. He, com he combined everything. I don't, okay. So she was bleeding for 12 years, right? So the flesh, Augustine says this, will press in, but the faith is what will touch. The faith is what will touch. The, fe the, the flesh is what will, will press in. And I think a lot of times... Uh, a lot of times we want to get close to the situation, but we're afraid to extend that last thing that says, 
okay, I'm, I'm okay if I look like a fool when I do this. And that's what we got to get to the point. You can even come around and be a part of the action, but you got to extend a hand. You got to walk this out. Allow faith to work in your life. It says in verse 29, remember, she said, if I can just touch his robes. And it says in verse 20, uh, 29, instantly her flow of blood ceased. 12 years, one touch. And she sensed in her body that she was cured of her affliction. What I love about this story is that because of, you ready for this? Jairus, Jairus, his faith, another person got healed. Because he asked Jesus to come heal his daughter out of desperation. Jesus is now walking in the community. And because he's following Jairus to go heal her daughter, guess what happens? In the journey of walking by faith, somebody else got touched. And I love what I love about ministry, if you're in a, in a work environment, you work at an insurance company and you're like, oh, I can't wait until Wednesday until I, you know, I'm going to have lunch with one of my clients. Well, maybe before Wednesday, God has a different plan for you to minister to somebody else. Like it's a part of this whole thing is a ridiculous journey of faith. Just because we have one endpoint doesn't mean that God can't use you before you get to that point. And I think so many times we have these goals in mind, like, okay, I'm going to get through revived school. It's two years every day. And you're like, after those two years, I'm going to go, I'm going to go change the world, change the world today. Like we want to reach all of Elkhart County in Northern Indiana. Guess what? I believe it can happen because you're bringing your buddy. I believe it can happen. And you don't have to wait until you find nine buddies. One buddy at a time, one day at a time, God wants us to use and find even those people that desperately need healing because you don't know where they are. Instantly, the flow of her blood ceased and she ceased in her body that she was, she sensed, excuse me, that in her body that she was cured of her affliction. In verse 30, at once, Jesus, I love this, he realized, he's kind of like, you just imagine how he was thinking. He says in, in himself that that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and he said, hey, who touched my robes? I love that question because you know he knows. He just wanted the person to recognize and his disciples, like classic disciples, you see the crowd pressing against you and you say, who touched me? Je Jesus, you have lost your mind again. You know, here we go again. And then in verse 32, he, so he was looking around. It was kind of like, yada, yada. <laughs> like, I didn't even hear my disciples. I didn't even hear him complaining. Who cares? I'm looking around. I know who did this. I want to see who they are. And so he's looking around. And then verse 33, then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, she came with fear and trembling and look exactly how she responds. She fell down before him and told him the whole truth. That's exactly what Jairus did before Jesus. Both people, all I can say is they fell at his feet. And I love this story because they realized, they realized they needed him. And they fell down, she fell down, and she told them the whole truth. I, I've been dealing with all of this stuff for 12 years. I've tried everything. Nothing has worked. The droppings from the donkey. <laughs> the fears from the drinks. <laughs> She's telling them everything, and I got nothing anymore. And I'm just going to be honest, Jesus, you're my last hope. You're my last ditch effort. I'm, I'll try you. Like, you just wonder if that's even at that point. I'm just, I just had to touch just to see if this works. And then in verse 34, it was, like, it was like an adoption process began to unfold. It was like he had a ceremony that says, I'm going to now welcome you in my family. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. When he says daughter, he, he's not upset. In fact, it's the only time he calls somebody here daughter. He welcomes her into the family. And, and what, how does he do this? He says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. That word peace in, in Israel, it's a very common word, shalom. Go in shalom. This word shalom, constable says, is that there's this freedom from inward anxiety. And it creates and puts wholeness of life. You see that? You're free from this inner anxiety and then this life enters in and then you begin to be put in, into this right relationship with God. You're free from all the burdens and the woes and the worries and it's like new life has entered. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I am giving you life. <laughs> 
Kevin, actually, can you go to Mark 3.35? Whoever does the will of God, I mean, have we not heard this before? Remember this whole Jesus' family didn't really like him because, I mean, they, were, they cared for him. They liked him. They just didn't care for what he was doing. He was tired. He's exhausted. He said, man, don't worry about my family. No, no, no. Whoever does the will of God, whoever walks by faith, whoever, can I just say, touches my robes, that's my brother and my sister and my mother. And Jesus goes back to Mark 3 and uses this incredible image. And so while this is happening in verse 35, Kevin, if you'll go back, it says, while he was still speaking, while Jesus was still speaking, okay, who's he speaking to? Is he speaking to the, to the woman? The bleeding had just stopped. While he's still speaking, people, okay, came from the synagogue leader's house, Jairus' house, and they said to Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? So all of a sudden, okay, one touch, the woman is totally healed. Now all of a sudden the story's back. Jairus, his daughter, really the saga continues. He is, right, right now the mission has stopped. Why bother the teacher anymore? The teacher, why would you bother that your daughter is is dead. Now watch as the scripture says, this is really cool. But when Jesus overheard what was said, he told the synagogue leader, don't be afraid, only believe. There's something about you guys amidst the storms, amidst all of this stuff that's going on, you see this fear and belief. Okay, we have this saying at Time Revive, you know, this faith always trumps fear. Don't walk in fear, you walk in faith. That's, that's what he's saying. Don't be afraid. I want you to understand and walk by by faith. And so in verse 37, he didn't let anybody accompany him except Peter, James, and John. It's a cool story. Three guys. We know that uh, earlier on, or later on, I should say, I guess in Matthew, uh, these are the three that are at the Mount of Transfiguration. They're at Transfiguration. We know that those three are at the Garden of Gethsemane. Like, it's kind of like, I'm going to bring my inner core because I want them to see something really special. It had to have been quite a task, though, to go from a giant crowd around to only you three. Yeah, like he's having a hard time escaping crowds wherever he goes. Somehow it happens. He didn't let anybody accompany him except Peter, James, and John. And now it says this. Watch. It says in verse 38, they came to the leader's house and he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Just so you know, back then, this is one of the weirdest things that I studied on is that they, these, are, these people are paid. They're paid mourners. People, when people die, you hire people to mourn, to sing, to play flutes, to clap hound, uh, to clap their hands. Like, this is how you do this. You hire people to be at your funeral. Even the poorest husband had to hire at least two flute players and one female to, to wail when wife died. So even if you're poor, the minimum is two flute players and one female to wail. Like, this was a given. If somebody dies, Oh yeah, I am the professional mourner. It's a weird job. So they're already, they're already mourning. Jesus walks in in verse 39. He says, why are you making a commotion and weeping? <laughs> kind of like, you just wasted your money. <laughs> the child's not dead, but asleep. And in verse 40, because everybody at times thinks Jesus is out of his mind. It's like, this is the craziest thing. They want what he has, but they also think he's weird. You know, it's like this weird, like, Weird picture, and they started laughing at him, but he, he put them all outside. All the people that are laughing, get out of here. He took the child's father, that would be Jairus, the mother, and those who were with him, Peter, James, and John. So we've got five people. They enter in the place where the child was. In verse 41, then he took the child by the hand. As a servant, you guys, what I love about Jesus, he's not afraid to touch the unclean. He's not afraid to engage those that are, are, are filled with demons and those that are just sick and desperately need life in their, in, in, in to themselves. He took the child by the hand and he said this, Talitha Kaum, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, get up. It's an awesome picture. It says in verse 42, immediately the girl got up and began to walk. And how old was the little girl? 12 years old. You know, I, there's been all kinds of theories and perspectives and angles 12 years bleeding, 12 years old. I, I really don't know. I just think that the Lord obviously is showing it doesn't matter what age you are, who you are, what your background is, how long you've endured your hardships. Jesus can still heal. 
And it says, when the people saw this, it says at this, they were utterly astounded. <laughs> the word means that they were actually out of their minds with great amazement is what that means. So now those people became out of their minds. <laughs> And then verse 43, classic Jesus, he gave them strict orders so that no one, that no one should know about this and that said that they should be given some, that she should be given something to eat. This whole public ministry, Jesus still wants to do ministry. He still wants to be able to walk. He still wants to be able to continue to go places. And so if they continue to spread the word, he's going to have a really, really hard time going places. So what do you do with a, a, a father who wants his daughter healed? What do you do with a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years? You know, for me, it all comes down to one word. Jesus is the only one that can give life. In fact, Kevin, if you would, would you go to uh, John 10, 10? Satan's goal, okay, it's pretty clear, was to go after Jairus' daughter. Satan's goal was to go after the woman bleeding for 10 years. In fact, it says a thief comes to only steal and to kill and destroy. That's what Satan wants to do to all of us. But Jesus says, I've come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Jesus wants to give life. You just have to literally have faith and invite him into your life. Can you go to John 11 verse 25? I think this is just a great tie in as well. John 11, verse 25, as we just wrap things up, he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Remember, Jesus eventually is going to die, be buried, and come back to life. The resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, look what happens, will live. So let, let's just say this. Let's just say Jairus' daughter dies. Let's just say the woman bleeding for 12 years, it doesn't stop. But what if both of them say, Jesus, I believe you are the resurrection and the life. Guess what happens? Even if they die, even if they don't physically see a healing, guess what happens? Jesus says, if you believe in me, you'll still have life. Don't bank your faith on Jesus on whether or not he heals. You bank your life on whether or not he died, uh, was buried and came back to life. Because when you do that, I, I love this, as one commentator says this, this is a whole message of a word of faith, a word of hope, and a word of love, and a word of power. Jesus is coming through his power to give us eternal life. And Jeff, you had mentioned this verse uh, before the break, Romans 8, 1 through 2. And to me, it kind of puts uh, all of this together. In Romans 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. But look what it says in verse 2 because the Spirit's law of life. So whatever you're being bond in, the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. Whatever you're in bondage of, Jesus's life can set you free from the law of sin and of death. All I can tell you is this, Jesus is here to give you life. The question is, is do you want it? It's a fun story of two people complete opposite of the spectrum and they both realized he was the only one that can give life. Thanks for listening to Lesson 33, Mark 5. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.